All right, this video is over complex numbers and complete factorization. And I highlighted complete there because I literally mean complete and utter factorization of any polynomial in the world. So to talk about this, the first is talk about complex numbers. Complex numbers are a joint between real numbers and imaginary numbers. So when we take real numbers and combine them with imaginary numbers, we get complex numbers. Everybody knows real numbers like 6 and 7 and negative 3 and even radical 5 is a real number. Those are real numbers. Imaginary numbers involve i, the imaginary number. So we got 6i, negative 3i, radical 2i. We usually put the i in front if it's a square root. That way we don't think it's inside. So let's take a quick jaunt down memory lane and talk about the imaginary number i. So the imaginary number i is the square root of negative 1. So anytime you end up with a, a negative inside of your square root, that is the imaginary number i. Normally we stop when we see a negative in a square root, but now we're going to continue on. So when you see a negative in the square root, it could come out as an i. Now this does have a very interesting side note to it. When we square both sides here, um, which is completely okay under algebra rules, I get that i squared is equal to negative 1. So that's the kind of the cool thing is that i squared actually becomes a non-imaginary number. So i squared is a real number, negative 1. So um, here's a couple of examples. For example, square root of negative 25, we're no longer going to stop and say can't do it. We're now going to say, well, the negative is an i and the 25 is 5. So once again, the idea here is we're separating the negative 1 and the 25. So the square root of negative 1 is the i and the square root of 25 is the 5. Same thing down here. The square root of negative 64 now becomes 8i. The square root of negative 100 now becomes 10i. Again, we're separating the negative from the 100 part. Over here, if it cannot be perfect, don't worry about it. Just leave it in the square root. However, the negative 1 times 6, the negative comes out as the i and the radical 6 stays radical 6. Make sure you're still reducing square roots. For example, the square root of negative 20, once again, the negative comes out as the i, but 20 can be written as 4 times 5. So essentially, we're actually breaking this down three times. Negative 1 times 4 times 5. The negative 1 comes out as an i, the 4 comes out as a 2, and the square root is stuck inside the square root, or the 5 is stuck inside the square root. Same thing with 27. 27 is negative 1 times 9 times 3. The negative comes out as an i, the 9 comes out as a 3, and the square root of 3 is what is left behind. So that's imaginary numbers. Now, complex numbers, back to complex numbers, again, it's a part, it's a combination of a real part and an imaginary part. So the general form of a complex number is a plus bi, where a is the real part and bi is the imaginary part. So here's a couple examples, 3 plus 2i. We got the real part 3, the imaginary part 2i. 6 minus 0i. Now this is a complex number, but most people would just write 6. If there's no imaginary part, if the imaginary part is 0, why even write it? Well, if you want to write it as a complex number, you do have to include the imaginary part, even if it's not even there. So um, even plain old numbers like 10 can be written as complex if we just put a 0i next to it. So here's a part that has no real parts. We fill the real part in with 0 and then 4i. Obviously, you can just write 4i here. You don't have to put the 0, but this is showing you that it's a complex number, part real, part imaginary. Here's another one, 9 minus 3i radical 2. Another one, 10 plus i radical 5, negative 5 minus 2i. Just showing you different parts, real part on the left, imaginary part on the right. That's typically how we write complex numbers. All right, complex numbers are numbers, so we can add them, we can subtract them, we can multiply them, and we can divide them. So let's add these two together. So I got two complex numbers, 2 plus 3i and negative 5 minus 8i. So when we add them together, we add the real parts. So 2 plus negative 5 is negative 3, and we are allowed to add the imaginary parts. So 3i and plus a negative 8i is negative 5i. So we can add them together, just add the real parts, and then add the imaginary parts. We can also subtract them. Be careful with subtraction because that negative sign does go to both the negative 5 and the negative 8. So I get 2 minus negative 5. 2 minus negative 5 is a positive 7. That's the real part. 3 minus a negative 8 is 3i minus a negative 8i is 3i plus 8i. So that would be 11i. So 7 plus 11i is if I subtract them. Multiplying them um, is a little bit trickier, but still very, very easy. So let's go ahead and write 2 plus 3i times negative 5 minus 8i. When I multiply this, I'm going to go ahead and still FOIL, just like we always would. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. On the outside, I get a negative 16i. On the inside, I get a negative 15i. And lastly, I get a negative 24i squared. Now, 
what's interesting is this is the easy part to see. A negative 16i, negative 15i make a negative 31i. I almost wrote the wrong thing, negative 31i, that's easy to see. But be careful, here, we all learned earlier that i squared is negative 1. It becomes real. When you take i squared, it becomes a real negative 1. So that's actually going to make that a positive 24. So I get a negative 10 and a positive 24 combined to make my real part of 14. So my final answer would be 14 minus 31i. Easy to see the i's combined to make the negative 31, but be careful. Make sure you realize that that i squared actually turns it into a positive 24. Positive 24 with the negative 10 makes the 14. So that is how you could use operations with complex numbers. Okay, now let's talk about zeros, because that's where we really care about is complex zeros. Um, complex zeros um, is a very easy statement. So if x equals a plus bi is a zero, that would be a complex zero, then it would also have a complex factor, a minus x minus a minus bi. So just like we've been working with factors, if we know a zero, we also know its factor. All we're trying to do is now is add the fact that they can be complex zeros, which would mean they'd have complex factors. Um, another important aspect to understand is that i really does, remember, it stems from a negative 1, square root of negative 1. So remember, like square roots, complex zeros always come in conjugate pairs. Just like square roots always come in pairs, so do i's, or complex zeros. So if x minus 5i is a 0, then automatically x equals 2 plus 5i is a 0. That would mean that x minus 2 plus 5i is a factor, and that x minus 2 minus 5i is another factor. So understand that complex conjugates or complex zeros always come in what we call conjugate pairs. So uh, here's another example. If 3i is a 0, then you automatically know negative 3i is a 0. If 7 plus uh, 6i is a 0, you automatically know 7 minus 6i is another 0. Now, I call these hidden zeros because of this. Let's just say that I have x minus 2 plus 5i is a factor, and x minus 2 minus 5i is another factor. Let's actually multiply this out just to show what happens. So x times x is x squared. x times negative 2 is negative 2x. x times negative 5i is negative 5ix. Negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Negative 2 times negative 5i is positive 10i. And almost done. 5i times x is 5ix. 5i times negative 2 is negative 10i. Uh, and then finally, 5i times negative 5i is negative 25i squared. So I ran out of room there. Negative 25i. Let me just rewrite that so it's clear. Finally, that last guy, 5i times negative 5i is negative 25i squared. Okay, so watch what happens. Anybody with an i, negative 5ix will cancel with the positive 5ix. 10i cancels with the negative 10i, always cancels. So I'm left with x squared, negative 2x and negative 2x makes negative 4x. And then remember, an i squared really becomes a negative 1. So that really turns that into a positive 25. So the 4 and the 25 make a 29. Now, I call it a hidden 0 because this would be my function. And this is a pretty simple, basic-looking quadratic. But believe it or not, it has two complex, ugly-looking zeros. x equals 2 minus 5i, and x equals 2 plus 5i. So when you would multiply those factors together, even though they're complex, ugly-looking factors, they do multiply to make something that looks fairly normal. So that's why I call them hidden zeros, because the problem looks totally OK, but there are some really kind of weird-looking complex zeros hidden in there. All right, so this brings us to our main theorem that we need for today, and um, that is <coughs> finding com the complete factorization. So now we can find all zeros and factors of a polynomial, real and imaginary. And this is because of the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra says, if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is larger than 1, then f has exactly n zeros in the complex number system. So basically what I'm saying is, whatever your degree is of your polynomial, that's exactly how many zeros you have in the complex number system. Some could be um, real, some could be complex, um, but the idea is that's exactly how many factors you have. 
um, including the complex ones. So let's take a look at some examples now. I've only got four examples for you and the video will be over. So um, first here, this is a basic quadratic. How do you find the zeros of a basic quadratic? Well, one, you could factor, but I'm going to tell you right now there's no point in trying because this is unfactorable. The second way is the quadratic formula. So let's go ahead and use the quadratic formula real quick here. So we have the opposite of b is negative 6 plus or minus b squared, which is 36, minus 4, times a is 1, times c is 10, all divided by twice a, which is 2. All right, now, let's see here. All i got to do is figure out the inside. 36 minus 40, 36 minus 40 is negative 4, all divided by 2. Up until now, we would have stopped and said there's no zeros, but there are some zeros. They're just complex. Here we go. Negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 4, remember, is 2. The negative comes out as an i, so there is a complex zero there. Now, don't forget, a lot of you guys mess this up. You divide everything by 2, so that becomes negative 3 plus or minus i. Does negative 6 gets divided by 2, and so does the 2i. So I get two zeros, negative 3 plus or minus i. Told you they always come in conjugate pairs. That means I have two factors, x plus 3 minus i and x plus 3 plus i. Believe it or not, if you were to multiply that out, you would come back to the original function x squared plus 6x plus 10. All right, here's another one. Once again, don't even try factoring it. I'm going to tell you that it can't. And let's go ahead and use the quadratic formula. So I get the opposite of b, which is positive 6, plus or minus the square root of 36 minus 4 times a is 9 times c is 37. Kind of a big number there. All divided by twice a is 18. So I get x equals 6 plus or minus the square root of. Inside that square root, if you happen to use your calculator, you do get a negative 1,296. All divided by 18. Now, I don't expect you to recognize that, but that is a perfect square. Believe it or not, the square root of 1,296 is a perfect 36. And then the negative comes out as an i. And it's all divided by 18. Now, once again, everything gets divided by 18. So 6 divided by 18 is 1 third, plus or minus 36 divided by 18 is 2i. So there are my two zeros, 1 third plus 2i and 1 third minus 2i. So again, the quadratic formula, as long as we allow the negative to come out as an i, is possible to use. All right, so here's the ultimate problem that we want to work on, being able to find the complete factorization, real or imaginary. So here's a function, and I'm going to give you two known factors. So the fact that this is a factor means that x equals 3 is a 0, and that x equals negative 2 is a 0. So let's go ahead and use synthetic division. And that's an ugly straight line, but anyway. So I have 1, negative 3, 6, 2, and negative 60 are my coefficients. 4, 3, 2, 1, None. Make sure they're all there. And I'm going to start off with the 3. It actually wouldn't matter if we started off with the 3 or the negative 2. You could start off with either one of them. I just better get a big, beautiful 0 right here. So drop down the 1. 3 times 1 is 3. That adds to make a 0. 3 times 0 is 0. That adds to make a 6. 3 times 6 is 18. That adds to make a 20. 3 times 20 is positive 60. And I get that beautiful 0 I wanted. Now, because I know another factor, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to do double synthetic division here. This time, I'm going to use the negative 2, the other known 0. Drop down the 1, multiply to get negative 2, add to get negative 2, multiply to get 4, add to get 10, multiply to get negative 20, and I get that last beautiful 0. So I'm left with x squared minus 2x plus 10. Once again, I had a fourth degree. I used two zeros to drop it down to a second degree. Now, how do I figure out what my remaining real or imaginary zeros are? Well, you could try to factor, but I'm going to tell you, keep trying if you want, but it can't. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to have to use the quadratic formula. So x equals the opposite of b is 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared is 4, minus 4, times a is 1, times uh, c is 10, all divided by 2. And I get here 2 plus or minus the square root of, let's see, that's going to be 4 minus 40 is going to be negative 36, I believe. And all divided by 2, and I get 2 plus or minus 6i. Hopefully you understand that. The negative comes out as an i, the 36 comes out as a 6, all divided by 2. Don't forget that everybody gets divided by 2, so I get 1 plus or minus 3i. So I factor this guy to x minus 1 plus or minus 3i, I guess it wouldn't matter the order, and then x minus 1 plus 3i. So those are my two additional factors. I have the original factors I gave you, x minus 3 and x plus 2. So now I have the complete factorization of this problem. 
two parts are real and two parts are imaginary, but there are a grand total of four factors because this was a fourth degree polynomial. So the fourth degree tells me that there are guaranteed to be four complex um, factors. All right, last problem of the day here. This is a cubic, it's a third degree, so I automatically know there are three factors for sure. I'm telling you that x equals 5i is one of the zeros, and you should automatically know because they come in pairs that negative 5i is another zero. So let's go ahead and use that to our advantage here. So we have 2, 3, 50, and negative 75. Oh, I almost wrote the wrong number there. And um, I'm going to go ahead and use indebted division twice. Even though I gave you one zero, we knew that because they're conjugates, they always come in pairs. So I'm going to start off with 5i out here. Now watch this. It's going to be a little bit tricky, but just be careful. Drop down the 2. 5i times 2 is 10i. I can't add these together because one is real and one is imaginary, so I'm just going to list them as 5i times 3 plus 10i. Now, when I multiply, I have to distribute. 5i times 3 is 15i. 5i times 10i, I'm going to come over here and do a little bit of dirty work, 5i times 10i is 50i squared. But remember, i squared actually becomes real, it becomes a real negative 1, so that's really a negative 50. So I get negative 50 plus 15i, so I got a real part and an imaginary part. Beautiful, because now my 50s cancel, and I get 15i. When I multiply 5 times 15 is 75i squared. But the i squared, remember, is a negative, so that makes that a negative 75, and I just get 0. So that's really good news. Now, remember that I knew that negative 5i was another 0, so I'm going to use synthetic division again here. Drop down the 2, multiply to get negative 10i. This is great news. Now my 10i, negative 10i cancel, and I just get 3. Negative 5i times 3 is negative 15i, adds to make a 0 exactly what I wanted. So even though working with i's through syndetic division can be a little bit tricky, do some dirty work if you have to, it shouldn't be too bad. So I had a cubic, I knocked it down by using two factors, which means this is now linear, 2x plus 3, and that is a beautiful factor that has x equals negative 3 halves as it's 0. So my factors are 2x plus 3, x minus 5i, and x plus 5i. So here is my complete factorization. And I definitely see that the leading coefficient of 2 is right here, because I get 2x times x times x makes it 2x cubed. So that all checks out. And I have my three zeros of 5i, negative 5i, and the new zero I found at the end there, negative 3 halves. So um, hopefully adding complex zeros into it isn't too much of a hiccup. It does involve a little bit more work. But now we know that whatever your degree is, is exactly how many factors you should have in the end, whether they're real, imaginary, or complex.